So today's theme is about change. And so I want to tell you about how music changes the brain and also a personal story about how it changed my brain. And so I'm going to start with that. And I want to tell you um, about when I was uh, an adolescent. And uh, like many adolescents, I was listening to the music that all of my friends were listening to, which was sort of you know mediocre rock and roll music. And one day, um, somehow, I came into the possession of um, a record album. This is what uh, a vinyl record looks like, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. <laughs> and uh, this is of music by Bela Bartok, the Hungarian composer who died in 1945. I had never heard of Bela Bartok. I had no idea what it was. I really just randomly sort of put it on just to see what it sounded like. And this is what I heard. So I still get chills when I hear this. And back then, when I was like 13, I experienced this epiphany. I had I'd never heard anything like this. I had chills down my spine. I had goosebumps. I just felt this unbelievable sensation um, that I, I really couldn't explain. And so I, it really changed me in the sense that I it gave me a focus about something that I really needed to pursue. And so I decided right then that I would try to understand more about music. I would try to learn about music. I would try to learn to play music. And that I would also perhaps try to apply science to music because I was already quite interested in science. I was already training as a scientist. And so I tried to put these things together. Now, the experience that I had, of course, um, is one that probably many uh, of you have had and indeed, it is something very common in our species. So human beings have been enjoying music for an extremely long time. So this uh, flute, for example, that you see here dates from the Upper Paleolithic period. That's about 35 to 40,000 years ago. And this particular specimen was found in a cave in uh, the Danube Valley in what is now part of Germany. What's remarkable is that at that time, this part of Europe was under glaciers. So you know, the living was not easy at that uh, point for these people who were making these remarkable musical instruments. So they must have felt a tremendous power of music to devote energy and resources and time to the creation of musical instruments. It must have been extremely important in some sense uh, for their survival that they would even carry out uh, these activities when uh, survival was so difficult otherwise. So how is it, what are the what are the brain systems that allow us to be able to create music, to perform on musical instruments, to perceive musical patterns, and to experience the pleasure from them? Well, we know uh, a fair bit about this now over the last few years in many laboratories around the world and in mine as well. We have been trying to dissect some of these uh, neural pathways. And this diagram tells you a little bit about some of the um, important um, circuits that are involved in connecting different parts of the brain, particularly those that involve perception of sound and the motor system for production of sound. And a kind of a close-up look of it is here. So the colored areas represent the portions of the brain that are devoted to the perception of sound. So this is known as the auditory cortex. And then you have connections going from there to other regions, particularly those that involve um, control of the motor system. So you have a kind of a loop between the auditory and the motor systems that allows us both to perceive and to produce music. And a point that I want to make is that when you become trained in music, you basically fine tune these circuits to a remarkable degree. In this uh, video that I'm going to show you in a second, which is courtesy of my colleague Marcelo Wanderley, what you will see is the um, motion trajectory of the bow of a violin as the violinist is playing. So there's a sensor at the tip of the bow, 
And as the violinist is playing, you'll see the patterns that it uh, creates. And I want you to pay attention to the precision with which these patterns are shown so that you'll see that the movements completely overlap one another in uh, quite a beautiful way. You see those loops? You see how they're perfectly superimposed on one another? Look at this figure eight. Isn't it beautiful? As you're playing on two strings, you form this figure eight. Sometimes I think we should just forget about the lecture and listen to the rest of the partita and <laughs> we would be very happy. So what allows this level of precision? How is it that you can train your brain to be this accurate? Well, one thing that is interesting is that um, musical training can actually change your brain structure. And this was actually predicted by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who um, won the Nobel Prize for uh, Medicine and Physiology in 1906. And in 1904, he actually predicted this idea that the brain might be physically changed by um, training. So he, sp he specifically mentioned the idea of musical training. He said the ability of a, pan of a pianist requires many years of mental and physical practice. And to understand this phenomenon fully, we have to admit the formation of new pathways and progressive growth of nerve terminals. So he had this idea that the anatomy of the brain could actually be changed by training. And this concept um, was just a hypothesis at the time. He didn't have any direct evidence for it. But in um, our laboratory and others, we've been able to demonstrate that indeed there um, are some of these um, anatomical changes. So what you see here are the two halves of the brain, the two hemispheres, left and right. And the colored areas represent areas where the thickness of the cortex is actually greater in people who've received musical training compared to a control group uh, who does not have musical training. And the areas that um, distinguish these groups are not surprisingly the auditory areas that I showed you earlier, as well as the motor cortex, and importantly, areas of the frontal cortex, which are involved in many types of higher order cognitive functions, including um, executive functions like uh, planning or anticipation or um, uh, being able to um, uh, create, um, to pay attention to new, new uh, events that are coming up. One important uh, detail about this sort of result is that it is linked to the age at which you start training. So we see in this image, the blue region is a, an area of the frontal cortex, but its uh, degree of change is linked to the age at which the person began to train with music. So the earlier you start, the more change you have. And uh, this is uh, quite important because it speaks to the plasticity of the brain, which is greater in earlier ages than in later ages. And you may recall I said I was about 13 when I had that experience of music, and so I'm one of those blue dots over there. Uh, so my, my uh, frontal cortex isn't quite as developed, which is really why I'm here giving you a lecture about science and not you know, playing an instrument, which is perhaps what I would do had I started early enough. Now, all of this um, that I've been telling you about is with respect to the ability to perceive and to produce music, but Really what I uh, would like to tell you about is about how it is that we experience pleasure from music. And to do that, we have to go to a very different system of the brain. So everything I've been talking about up until now is in the cortex, which is the outer um, part of the brain. Now we have to go into the deep structures. And there's one particular structure, structure known as the striatum, which is especially important in the representation of um, pleasurable experiences. And this has been discovered uh, many, many years ago. So that, for example, if you take um, a lab rat and you give it food and you measure activity in its brain, you will see that in this area known as the striatum, the uh, dopamine neurons will be more active when the animal is receiving food. So this is basically a kind of a chemical signal uh, within the nervous system saying, well, this is really good. This, what you're getting now is really important. You should try to get more of it if you can.
And uh, it's not just in uh, lab rats, but we can see this in um, uh, healthy human uh, participants as well. So if you put people in a brain scan machine and you give them monetary rewards, so you play some kind of a gambling game, for instance, or you give them food rewards, or you expose them to erotic images, you will see a very similar response in this deep structure known as the striatum. That's what this slide illustrates. So there's a common activity in this, what we call the reward system, to these stimuli, which are essentially essential for survival. So you need food, obviously, to survive. You need sex for the species to survive, for reproduction. And um, monetary rewards, you need them uh, only insofar as the money is fungible, right? So you can exchange it for some, uh, something of value. And so we wondered, could it be that music would engage the same biological system? Even though it is not a substance, you also get these responses to drugs, by the way, but music is not a chemical substance. It's not, strictly speaking, necessary for survival. And indeed, we've been able to demonstrate that in a series of, of experiments, you very consistently show that um, the striatum is active to highly pleasurable music. We've seen this with blood flow. When we measure blood flow in the brain, we see it with dopamine receptors. So when we measure dopamine uptake, while people are experiencing pleasurable music, we see an increase in the striatum. And we can also see it with um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which me measures uh, blood oxygen. And uh, there again, we see it. And this last study is sort of interesting because what we were doing there uh, was looking at how much value people assign to music. So in this experiment, uh, people were um, exposed to uh, pieces of music that they hadn't heard before, and they were asked to decide whether they wanted to buy it or not. And if they did, they had to put a certain amount of money down. So it's kind of like iTunes, where you hear a little excerpt of music, and then you decide you want to buy it, and you can pay different amounts. So the way the experiment proceeds is like this. You might hear the first sample. Well, that's OK. Maybe we'll give it 99 cents. All right. Now the next sample comes in. Now I don't really care for that. I think I'll give it a zero. We'll go to the next one. This is kind of groovy. Maybe I'll give it a dollar twenty-nine. So in the experiment, what we do is we use the amount of money as an estimate of the value for that individual to that particular piece of music. And then we look in the brain what's happening with our functional imaging device. And what we see is not only that the reward system is active, in other words, there is more of a response in this region we call the striatum, uh, the more money you're willing to give, but also, and very importantly, the reward system increases its communication with the auditory cortex, the more value that is assigned. In other words, those regions that I talked about earlier in, um, th that have to do with perception are more strongly coupled with the regions that have to do with um, emotion and reward the more you like something, the more you like the music. And so this basically links these two systems of the brain on the left side, we have these cortical systems, which are actually the most phylogenetically advanced parts of our brain. These are the parts of our brain that distinguish us from uh, other species, including other primates, um, to a greater degree than any other region. And um, all of these cortical areas have to do with perceiving sounds and being able to plan for the future, um, which means that you, as you hear music unfolding, you're able not only to perceive the sounds, but you also have an expectation about what the next sound is. And the musician or the composer will sort of play with those expectations so that they are fulfilled to a greater or lesser extent. That's all sort of very cognitive. But on the other hand, we have this interaction with what is one of the most phylogenetically ancient parts of our brain, which is the, these deep structures in the reward system, which we share with many other animals. So music represents a kind of a, a fusion, if you will, of these two systems, the most sort of advanced cognitive system with the most um, powerful uh, emotion and reward systems. And this is basically the idea that I want to leave you with, is that music has a great power to uh, engage us, to make us feel emotion, and to change our brains. And 
the way we're thinking of it is that it derives this power precisely because it combines these two um, very, very important systems in our brain. And that, I think, is um, the message that I want to leave you with, and also, I think, the idea that by combining science and art, we can actually gain a deeper understanding uh, in the two domains, that these are not two separate domains that really should be fused, and I think if we want to think about change, we want to think about how can we bring science and art together. Thank you very much. Robert Zatori.